Um, all right, well, welcome everyone to our first official healthcare seminar series. Um, today's topic is with Tony York and Don McAllister. Um, they really need no introduction, so I'll let them hand it over. Before I do though, um, just some housekeeping that I'm gonna remind everyone of. Um, we are recording this session and the recording will be made live uh, afterwards for those who can't make it or have to drop off early. And at the end, to a reminder for uh, a survey we'll be sending out just with future topic ideas, how you felt about the session today and what you're looking to get out of this in, in the future topics. Uh, and finally, too, we'll leave some space at the end for questions. So please feel free to ask uh, using the chat feature and we'll try and answer questions as promptly as possible uh, or follow up with you after the sessions uh, with some specific answers there. But uh, I will hand it over to Tony to take it away. Thanks, Alex. And thanks everyone for joining me in what is our inaugural discussion on one of my favorite topics, healthcare security. My name is Tony York and many of you may know me uh, from the writings that uh, I've been able to be a part of with hospital and healthcare security. And some of you may know me uh, through the work I've done with IHSS um, and the council and guidelines. But a lot of folks have, have asked me in the last few weeks, why, why do this? Why have this conversation on healthcare security? And I think it's important that we all recognize that healthcare security is evolving, probably faster than at any time in my four decades of serving the industry. And the role we play as leaders and practitioners in the side of the industry is changing as rapidly. And it's probably never been more important than it is in today's world. This series of healthcare security discussions is really a masterclass. It's, it's really going to try to probe into some of the most pressing issues that are facing healthcare security. And now that I am in that fourth decade, I was hoping to honor a little bit of how we got here, how we have evolved into today's world of healthcare security so we can learn from the past. But just as importantly, we're really able to understand some of these pressing issues that we're facing and how we keep today's environment of care safe and secure. These are gonna be monthly discussions and they're gonna be a deep dive into various topics. And it's a true hope that we're gonna take the learnings from this information and really take away some of the conversations with some of the brightest minds in the healthcare security industry to really collectively do something that has always been a professional goal of mine. And that is raise that bar of professionalism in the healthcare security industry. So whether you're brand new to healthcare security, maybe even after a career in law enforcement, you've been recently promoted or you're one of the old hands like me, I think you're going to find these, discuss these discussions insightful and useful. So buckle in and let's get started. My inaugural guest today is one of the most influential international names in healthcare security and the most recent recipient of the IHSS Distinguished Life Works Medal, Don McAllister. I first met Don in 2006. We actually uh, were serving on the IHSS Board of Directors together, and I can't tell you how many times I've had an opportunity to collaborate with him on some of the most influential and fun projects I've been involved with. One was the last edition of Hospital and Healthcare Security, Another one was the security design guidelines for healthcare facilities, to name just a few. Don's a true mentor to me and to many others. He's a dear friend. And Don, I couldn't sit, ask anybody more to welcome me to the Fresh Dever uh, Healthcare Security Seminar. Don, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks very much, Tony. It's uh, it's great to be here and and start your series. And and uh, as you said in your introduction, I know we've had many great long conversations on healthcare security and various aspects of it. And today we get to do that again and and uh, folks get to listen in as well. And I hope I hope uh, they enjoy it and, and can learn a bit and take away from it and look forward to conversation with you today as always. Well, if folks could have just had the opportunity to be a fly on the wall with many of our conversations, Don, I think they would uh, have found it as insightful as I. But um, I'll, I'll start with a, something and, and I might be at risk of calling you old because I've got four decades in the business, but I think I recall you saying you had five in the business, so um, you got <laughs> yeah. me by a little bit of time. Kind of kind of you to bring that up, Tony, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell us, Don, uh, when you first got in the industry, what was it like? What was it, what, what, do you, what have you seen changed even since that earliest stage that uh, you got in the business? Well, I mean, I guess I, I think about it this way probably, is that 
if you think about how fast technology has changed, right? Even looking over the last 10 years and look at your smartphone and what it can do now compared to what it could do 10 years ago. And, you know, when in the late 80s, really, there wasn't that sort of technology. We we're just starting to get into, you know, electronic locks and cameras and just very rudimentary way. The communication systems were portable radios and landlines and pagers, uh, voice pagers that would boom in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep saying there was a, you know, a code red in the uh, in the acute care building. And, and you know, and in those days, I think security were kind of more of a reactive force, you know, and, and, and first of all, there weren't very many of us. Uh, you know, I think there were half a dozen people in security management in British Columbia, the province that I, I live in, and, and now there are over 50. Um, you know, speaking to the, the growth of the profession and, and and the emphasis that healthcare is increasingly put on on security as, as a, a key element of supporting the safe safe care of patients. So I, I think really that, you know, that, that sort of shift from reaction to proactive uh, security has been probably the biggest, the biggest change. And really the profile of the, the profile of the profession, you know, especially in the last 10 years, you know, driven largely by IHSS work with uh, external organizations like the American Nursing Association or um, with ASHI on the facility side around the design guidelines has really begun to put the security profession on the map and is recognized as, as, as a distinct profession that plays an important role in healthcare. And I really think that that's the biggest shift really from almost a reactive night watchman probably fire safety focus group to a group now that's that's proactive seen as a critical element in in healthcare and particularly with with uh, the increased emphasis on on uh, patient violence and the role security plays in that and i know i know that's that's a, a long separate seminar in itself but uh really i would say since the 1990s that's where the focus of healthcare security um, shifted and hasn't shifted again. And, and, and it shifted to a focus on uh, managing and preventing violence. Without question, you know, it's interesting to, to think about how the evolution of healthcare security has occurred. And, and I sort of go back into those early 90s, right? When, when we used to have this position inside of healthcare, we called them orderlies. And, uh, you know, whether they were working in a mental health or behavioral health unit or they were um, partnered up in, in one of the floors, um, it seemed like they were the first to respond to the calls of disruption, disruptive patient behavior. And then all of a sudden, those roles are no longer there. And lo and behold, who gets asked to pick up a lot of those pieces? It was the healthcare security officer. And I think we uh, saw at that time um the changes that were going on not to mention we we had a, just a tremendous uh, reduction in behavioral health funding that was happening across the globe and uh, i think we started seeing uh, the the issue of boarding happening yeah. but i'd be re i'd be remiss though don if if i didn't say you brought me into a conversation in my head about i think you brought in a bad memory of real to real video watching and um <laughs> thinking about the hours and days spent trying to find a red truck or something similar yes. uh that somebody uh came in that we had a witness talking about it so it is amazing how much things have changed in the time the, that we spent in our careers here well we used, yeah you're right we spent hours doing doing that and 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 um you know, when you think about it now, how has that shifted in terms of technology, you know, event generated video and, and so on, it just has shifted everything, you know, but I think to your point about the 90s, you know, I really think there where we sort of, I think with the best of in intentions, started shutting down large mental behavioral health uh, institutions uh, that, that, that housed hundreds and hundreds of patients in many cases and repatriated them in the community, but un unfortunately didn't transfer funding with it back to the community so the folks were often left to to their own devices um, trying to deal with their the challenges of mental health and and ended up at our emergency departments again across the globe and at the same time as you aptly described you know we were starting to find cost-cutting measures reducing orderlies or patient care aides or folks who used to be able to to, to pick up some of the slack from the clinicians around managing uh patients when they did become aggressive Security was the was was the logical choice to fill that vacuum, and 
and almost without exception, um, security forces increased across the globe and in healthcare, and that became a primary focus. You know, interestingly, I think we're starting to see a little shift back, you know, and, and um, we're starting to see uh, some healthcare organizations hiring, you know, what we would describe previously as orderlies or, or patient care aides or, you know, similar support positions, recognizing this vacuum and recognizing that as violence increases, um, you know, it's not security's role alone to manage to manage these challenges. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, Don, and, and, and it is nice to see that we're starting to recognize the importance of mental health and positive mental health and what we need to be able to accomplish when it comes to, you know, how we're supporting those that may be in a behavioral health crisis, um, which is a little different than the intentional violence that I think sometimes uh, I know I was anticipating when I first got into the industry that, hey, it was the criminal element, um, right. which, you know, when we start thinking about those who really are, are causing some of our most concerning issues, um, it, it is those same folks that we're really there to care for. Right. But that drives me to a, 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 a question that I just wanted to Make certain we, we talked a little bit about, Don, and something that you always impressed me about was how you connected the security program to the overall mission of care. Uh, that really speaks to that as, as well. And, and if you were speaking to somebody new to the industry, what advice would you have for them about how to really connect the security and protection program to what, what the real mission of the hospital and the healthcare organization is there for? Yeah, it's a big, a big, broad question, and, and not not something a new um, a new security manager could could introduce overnight. You know, I think the first thing I would say is that you need to understand the the environment in which you work, right? So whether you come from a background of policing or engineering or wherever you come from uh, into a security manager role, you know, you really have to understand healthcare. You know, and 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 healthcare is such a large, complex business. You know that that I really think the leaders and and the folks who work in the program, as much as they can, need to involve themselves in the business of healthcare. In other words, get on committees that may may not seem to have a lot of direct relevance to security. Um, you know, uh, participate, volunteer for activities uh, in the hospital. Get a sense of of what your organization's about. You know, and 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 really start to focus your attention. On, on a patient-centered approach. And I think I think once you do that, um, you're able to then start to build your security program um, strategically around the key elements of the organization's strategies and goals. You know, and I think that's really important and we're probably um, jumping topics and you probably expected this from me, Tony, after all these years, but you know, I think it's really important that we have a path that we follow as a security program. And, and that path is driven in big broad strokes through your strategic or your master plan and 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 comes to life annually in your in your security management plan. And from my perspective, it's really important that you understand where your organization is going and what's important to them. And then align your own planning activities with it. And I think for for a lot of new managers and even some folks who are, you know, may, maybe come directly from the security industry, they tend to try and think about fitting security somehow into these these strategic um, pillars, if you like, of the organization, and they don't fit neatly. You know, like uh, for example, if one of the strategic goals of a healthcare organization is, um, you know, a safe environment for staff to deliver care. You know, security manager can say, oh, I can align nicely with that one. I'll do, you know, A, B and C. That'll contribute to safe environment. I'm aligned with an organizational objective. Great. But if it's more broad than that, you know, um, you know, delivering quality care to the to the citizens in our communities. A lot of folks are challenged by that. They're like, huh, well, maybe that one doesn't apply to the security program. Maybe that's, you know, but, but in fact, it does, you know, because if you think about it, Delivering quality care also links to the safe environment, you know, and if you're thinking about your your how your staff are working every day in a hospital, whether it's wayfinding, whether it's picking up litter, whether it's uh, moving smokers along in a, in a in a polite way, whether it's responding to patients who are aggressive when receiving their care or waiting for care, 
all of these things align neatly with that organizational goal. And I think sometimes we try to be too um, too too direct in our approach of how how we support the organization's goals. So I think that's the first really important thing. And then your vision is going to drive that, right? Whatever whatever your vision is is it's going to be tied around something like a safe and accessible environment for the quality care of patients. It's going to be like that. And and, and all of the staff that you hire need to get that. You know, they really need to get that, that that's why they're there. That's why they get out of bed every day. You know, and if folks can't get out of bed every day and believe that's worth working hard for, then we probably don't have the right folks working in our program. So the first, the, that foundation is absolutely critical. From there, once you've developed that, you know, sort of that, that patient-centered culture, if you like, in your program, folks notice that, folks feel that everyday dealing with clinicians, executives, the committees you sit on, you're connected, you get it, you use the right language, you put the right priorities in place. You're, you're connected to the business of care. And some folks don't like to think of care as a business, but it is the healthcare business of care. You're connected to it. People feel it, people see it, your people live and breathe it every day. That becomes their driver, their motivation for coming to work. And and then you've got then you've got what you're looking for. That then you then you're connected. Your strategies are connected. You're accountable for for your performance and your plans annually. Your team are assigned pieces of the plans to allow you to meet the the objectives. They're accountable for that on their own performance plans. You know it it it, it sounds fairly simple when I describe it, but I go back to my opening point. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. It takes time to drive a culture of security into an organization and to drive a culture of patient care into a security program. Absolutely, Don, it's beautifully said. And I think you're touching on one of the points that I, I, I found I know in my travels over the years is, is, a, is an opportunity for a lot of security leaders, especially those in the healthcare arena, um, when we really think about why we're there. Um, and, and that reason why we're there is, is not just to provide a safe and secure environment, is to facilitate right. quality and patient care and, and the best outcome that an organization can deliver to those Absolutely. that are in that need. Um, our role, as I like to say it, is to create an environment so that can occur, right? Yep, yep, and, 100%. Um, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I shared with the, uh, with the program back in, um, in Reno back in the spring, an example of, um, thinking about some of the evolution. I remember early on when access control devices were really starting to, to take root. And uh, in many situations, we were finding ourselves in a place where trying to make such an investment, you know, when we started going from locking keys to having more of a sophisticated system in place, and it was gonna cost several hundred thousand dollars and trying to make the argument for um, how to get that. and and. I, I shared with the with the with the audience then, and I'll share it with them now. It is it was pretty interesting to see that the um, when I was making it a security. Oh, we need to be able to lock the doors. We need to be able to make certain that everyone is um, uh, is safe. It didn't always quite capture the, uh, the the same audience that I wanted to. We didn't really quite get to justification for the resources that we were looking for. Right. But it sure was amazing that uh, all of a sudden when we say. Hey, if we were in a uh, in a had any kind of endemic or we had a mass casualty going on, and we need to get control of our environment. Um, if I told them it would take 40 minutes to uh, to secure your environment, would you think that would be something that you'd want to have happen? And then all of a sudden, there was a whole big shift and change in saying, "Yeah, you're right. We need to be able to have control of our environment because it's a better patient experience. It's a better uh, and it's a safer patient experience." So, right. Uh, I, I think you're you're chatting about the same thing, and and master planning to me, Don, is something that I remember when you first uh, you first touched about that. I think you were well, we were still on the board together when you were chatting about you know how to really bring that to to the case. But when you start thinking about master planning, I mean, how do you find that that was so successful to your personal career and uh, and the programs that you administered? I mean, how did you get people aligned with what you were doing? Because that's an art into itself is to make the to, to plant those seeds so others are recognizing, hey, this is important for us to accomplish. 
realizing you've probably had to prioritize one or two things as well, I would imagine. So can you share with us a little bit about uh, some of those experiences? Yeah, that's a big, broad question. You know, my mind's my mind's drifting back then as I as I think about that. It, you know, I think uh, I guess I think a, a couple of things. First of all, the vision is is so important. It's you know, where do we want to be as a program in you know three to five years, uh, however long your your master planning cycle is, right? That needs to be clearly articulated. I think a lot of times we you know, we 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 create a strategic plan or or even a security management plan or sometimes a performance plan just because we need to have one, right? And so they become kind of a uh, a have to tool instead of a instead of a living document that that's going to drive what you're about for the next three to five years. So I think the way that you communicate that, the language you use, the regular focus on your on your planning activities with your team uh, internally, first of all, is a critical piece of it. So they, they need to buy in. They need to see that this is not a, you know, this is not a pain. This is this is this this is a document that helps guide our work. It helps guide where we're going that we believe in and we live and breathe every day. The second piece of that though is really making it important to your your boss, to the executives, to the organization, right? And and again we're going back to that sort of alignment with with the healthcare organizations strategies and goals for the for the same period the more in step you are with that the more buy-in you're getting from the executives and of course the more aligned your team is with the objectives of the organization sometimes you can do even sort of beyond that you know for example you know in in the us the, the requirement in in for accreditation around having a security management plan you know is is not in place in canada you know, but but many Canadian organizations had the foresight to look at that and say that's important, even though we're not required to do it. Um, you know, let's use the American experience and build that Canadian version of that um, that's going to drive our activities annually. You know, so I think that's a good example of sort of stepping out and 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 seeking uh, that structure or alignment that's lacking sometimes. Other way you can do it is sort of ensure you're you're, you're aligned with um, government objectives. You know, for example, I, I'm thinking back to uh, health emergency management objectives um, that are aligned with provincial objectives. So you've got provincial objectives, organizational objectives, and then program objectives. And the more alignment there is between those, um, the stronger your commitment from your team, and your stronger your connectivity with the executives, the healthcare organization, and even the province or state. Um, if they see that you're in step with that. So I think there's, there's, you know, I think that that's probably the, the notion of a living and breathing document that folks can buy into, you know, I think it is really important. The other piece that, I, that, that you know, I, we might talk about a little more on, on this session, but it just, just to drive is, is, is being able to demonstrate value, you know, so if you, you asked me earlier, what's changed from, you know, mm -hmm. over five decades, producing reliable data in our in our programs um, so that we can demonstrate value. You know, we, we never were able to do that. I would say even 20 years ago, you know, there were good healthcare security programs in North America that could, but that was that was the exception rather than the rule. Now we're tying that into being able to demonstrate value. And and I think that's that's really an important piece. I know there's been some really good work done um, by IHSS recently in, in, in working on standardizing um, categories of incidents and, you know, some of the language we use. You know, if you look at something like violence, I mean, every organization has been counting it in a different way and some have one category, some have 20 categories. It's, you know, and, and then you run into the issue of parallel streams of reporting, right? If you're talking about healthcare alignment, you've got patient safety reporting systems that are that are tracking, you know, um, medication errors or slips and falls, and they add violence in there. They get their stream, the OSHA stream of violence reporting. Sometimes you get triple reporting, you know. And again, that speaks to to a strong kind of enterprise risk program that aligns those reporting structures and allows the organization to have a clear picture of a phenomenon like violence, where they can then fund and take appropriate steps to to mitigate it. So, you know, I bounce around a little on that, but I think. Um, that's sort of been my experience on on, on selling uh, master planning. Yeah, you know, you you. Uh, I wished I could have said I uh, 
plugged you for the uh, instant categorization work, uh, knowing how important that work was uh, for the IHSS and the Council on Guidelines the last several years. Uh, seeing that uh, really get introduced has, has been um, a personal uh, pride for me to, to, to know that if we don't move the needle on consistency with how everyone is reporting it, we're going to always have what I refer to as the art of administrative preference. Um, typically, this this personal bias that uh, sits out there, so we won't be able to realize that. Hey, how effective are some of these mitigations that we've um, making uh, such strong arguments for introducing and and asking for you know six seven figures sometimes uh, yes. for funding to be able to support such an initiative and and, and it's a challenge and, and until the industry really uh embraces this and comes together as a whole i think we're going to find ourselves in a position where we're we're always going to face that 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 bias and and i don't know if we'll ever eliminate it altogether so there will always still be an art to how we sell um our programs and and how we market uh, the outputs that we expect to receive um but boy i tell you it would be much better to know that others have tried something and these are the outputs that they're seeing as a result of it so we can really have the science associated with some some better evidence-based practices that i know the association is so focused on right now yeah and I, and i think again going back to your question how do you link to the organization you know the more we can tie our data to to the business of care the the, the stronger the the more reliable the data is viewed by executives and healthcare organizations right i mean it'd be one thing for you to say you know we have a thousand aggressive acts a year in denver hospitals and we have you know a thousand aggressive acts a year in vancouver hospitals um you know what does you know what does that really mean you know but if you're able to say you know the this organization experiences you know x number of violent acts per a thousand patient days or per 100 ed visits or whatever sort of you know whatever denominator you want to use um then you're immediately speaking clinical language right and you're able to say you're able to 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 make distinctions between facilities and within organizations and even between organizations at some point for those that are willing to share data. But that's where you really are able to, to speak to that, right? You can talk about whether it's trying to increase staffing or changing uh, deployment of security staffing. Those things almost almost speak for themselves when you have good, reliable data that your executives can buy into because they get it. I mean, we used to be really bad at this. We used to be really bad at data. You know, other support services like housekeeping and food and uh, you know they were way ahead of security even in, in 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 producing good data you know and then as we started to pull away from the notion that we were a support service a more corporate service you know i think we became better at recognizing the importance of data and then set some some great healthcare security minds like like uh, the team that you worked with and yourself of course um to start to standardize this because it's it's really tough you get a lot of a lot of strong leaders who've done a lot of good work um that don't necessarily want to shift it and right. the note of shifting of it for the good of the industry that's tough that's probably that's probably the biggest stumbling block of getting standardized data absolutely it's it's change management 101 right and right. it's change being done to us instead of being done by us and right and and, 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 it's, and that's a tough one to to overcome especially when we know it's worked for us but um, you know, I think the, uh, the 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 instant categorization work itself is going to probably require some change for everyone. But if we don't move this needle, we're going to find ourselves being ha hampered. I guess is the best word I'll say by the management engineers that are forever coming in and out of healthcare and saying, "Well, you should only have X amount of security per square feet," when that has no implications to the the type of patient demographics we might be serving the type of support we may be providing for uh the patient care teams in the emergency department of behavioral health unit or wherever right and then we find ourselves in this position um flustered and frustrated and uh my new favorite word when i combine them flustered uh frustrated i guess is my new favorite <laughs> word i'm going to get into webster somehow some way but in saying that um i think it's important that we we, we manage that yeah but but don you you talked a little bit about something earlier as it relates to to really the overall plan and i've long been um, a big believer in something i think i first heard from 
some old IHSS colleagues, but it's it's always resonated with me that our that our security programs really ought to be about people. They ought to be about process and they ought to be about the technology themselves. And when you think about people, um, we're obviously seeing the healthcare security officer evolve and so are those leaders themselves. And when we think about leaders, you've had a chance to work with some great leaders and, and I've had a chance to call quite a few of them my friend as well. And, and But when you start thinking about the characteristics, the qualities of those leaders inside of healthcare security, share with be in the group a little bit about what you think are some of the, the best leadership characteristics and a little bit about the why behind them as well. Right, yeah. Well, I should tell the audience, first of all, these questions aren't scripted, so I'm <laughs> listening to Tony and kind of uh, waiting for him to put me on the spot on some of these. And, and uh, uh, leadership, for sure, I've been blessed. Probably the favorite part of my career is the people that I've met and worked with in this industry that I've learned from and worked alongside and and uh, just what a terrific experience. Some of the best healthcare security minds in the world I've been blessed to, to work alongside and, and to call my friends. And, and um, you know, I, I don't know that they share one characteristic, Tony, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think when you look at leadership, what makes, what makes a great leader, um, uh, I think I'll go back to my original point in healthcare is that they get healthcare, you know, first and foremost, they know, they know why they're there. You know, they may have different styles and, you know, um, some folks that, that that may be a little more pro enforcement model than others who are pro service model, um, but they have the same passion, the same commitment to creating a, a safe environment for their organization and ability to understand what their organization needs and and adapt their program to it. So they're not, you know, they're they're not so philosophically driven that they force their program programmatic beliefs into a in, into a healthcare organization, they do the opposite. They adapt their philosophy and their beliefs to fit the healthcare organization that that they serve. You know, and I think that's one that's one characteristic they all have. I think the 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 other big pieces that I always look for in people generally, but you see it in great healthcare security leaders, that the integrity, trust, respect. You know, uh, treating their teams with respect, treating others with respect. I remember in the 90s when when Canadians just f first started becoming active in IHSS and the great healthcare security leaders that have been doing it for a while that welcomed Canadians as as equals uh, as people that they could learn from and share with and network with um I think that all of all of the good healthcare security leaders have that characteristic and and um and and we're blessed we're blessed to have them in the, in the organization I think as well, they have the ability to to select good teams, you know, to sort of tuck their egos away and don't think that they need to be the, you know, the expert in all subject areas, right? I mean that that they need they need the, the they need to buy into the philosophy that the, that the team is stronger with the sum of its parts, and that some of those parts involve folks who really know technology, who really are great at analytics, who are, you know, who really get the 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 violence phenomena are able to connect with clinicians on that, that they each bring this diverse skill set together as a team. And I think the leaders that that I think of now, as you asked the question, Tony, have the ability to build those teams because I've been I've been blessed to meet many of their team members as well over the years in their organizations. So I think that that's another real commonality. I think the other the other thing that they have is the ability to be the ability to, to speak confidently to executives about what it is that we do and why it's important to use the right language to 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 be a business colleague uh, to be a healthcare leader first and a security leader second um, uh, all of the folks that I can think of and, and there's many many of them that that I think as strong healthcare security leaders um, they all have those those kind of attributes you know and I've likely missed some pieces but again uh, from the top of my uh, aging head, that's 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 what came out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John, I think you've touched on on a lot of points. I uh, I, I want to peel back on all of them, but but there were a couple of them that I I really wanted to to maybe dig in a little deeper with you, and and you just touched on on one, and and that is, you know, you think about the healthcare administrator, and in so many words, 
they they sort of come across as, hey, I need you to present to me in a be brief, be bright, and be gone type of approach. Right. And uh, I think sometimes our, our our industry practitioners are a little bit hesitant, maybe even reticent to approach them. And, and so when you think about communicating with the healthcare administrators and building a, a really solid rapport with them and to get the confidence in the security program that's necessary to really have success. Talk a little bit more about that. Talk about how you've built those relationships because I know that's been such a focal point for you over your entire career. Yeah, again, I would say it takes time. So it doesn't happen overnight that, the, you know, the security executives, uh, or sorry, the healthcare executives are, are are watching us from a distance. They're listening to people. They're getting input from people in their programs about, uh, you know, who we are and what we're about and what our program's about. And I think the, one of the first things you have to do is is recognize that, recognize that you're almost always on display, and 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 um, that that it's not just built on your relationship with an executive or the executive team. It's built on your relationships uh, across the organization and and on your performance. Sometimes you get the, the opportunity to be put in the spotlight and, and perform. You know, it's um, uh, there's an emergency event or, you know, I was thinking of SARS that, that hit Canada quite hard in 2003 and obviously nothing like COVID. But, you know, there we got an opportunity to almost show show our value um, day to day as we managed an emergency. Right. And I think we didn't do anything different than we normally would. We just we just were on the stage for that time. And 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 so I think that that's important as well. I think that we need to be able to, we need to be we need to be educated and, and credentialed. Uh, we need to be articulate in business language. We need to be comfortable in boardrooms. We need to understand the executive's life that they don't want to, you know. Some I think some healthcare security leaders take the opportunity to get exposure to the executives to try and oversell almost, right? They take too much time. They try too hard. Almost here's their opportunity to look at me. So I'm going to I'm going to take full advantage of it, you know, and I find that that's that's not effective. What is effective is that whole notion of, of um, you know, be brief, be bright and be gone. The language that you used, that's what you want, you know, and when they say a briefing note, it's a briefing note. It's not a you know, it's not chapter one of our book, Tony, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a briefing note. What's the issue? What's the challenge? What's the solution? What do you need from them? Boom in and out and you do that from the first time you get that opportunity right that's how they operate that's how other healthcare executives operate you're a, you're a healthcare executive whose expertise is in security that's just right. as they just they have healthcare executives whose expertise is in finance or expertise is on the clinical side right you're a healthcare executive as a security leader whose expertise is in security they know that they get it you don't have to sell them on it be yourself, build your program, build a strong team, exhibit who your team is and what they're about every day. Little things I mentioned earlier, little tiny things when you don't think people are watching. You know, you're I've had I've been at hospitals where I'd be walking with a physician. He's showing me something. Stops in mid conversation to go help an elderly couple who are clearly lost and need some wayfinding help. I've been I've walked with clinical leaders turning outside of the hospital, looking at some design issue, who stop, leave me, to move some smokers along in a polite manner. You know, these are folks who who walk and talk, um, you know, the, the focus on, on care, the focus on empathy. And we need to do that all the time. And so the more closely you connected are with, closely connected you are with that, the more effective your program's gonna be, right? And I, I guess the last piece of guidance I would give folks is, don't try and rush to be credible. You'll you'll be credible. Right? Build your team, connect the care, and you'll be credible. It'll take care of itself. Uh, that's wonderfully said, Don. And you know, it's interesting. You're talking about the first chapter of the book. I was just going to say, you know, if you get a one-page briefer, you can always just shrink the font and uh, <laughs> and expand the margins, right? Uh, but um, and, and, and in saying that, though, I I think it's important. You know, I think about sitting in the CEO's chair and really, if you really bucketize the three things that anyone in that C-suite is really ultimately primarily responsible for, it really distills down to three things. They're responsible for strategy of the organization, their responsibility for risk 
facing the organization and they're responsible for the culture of the organization right. and those three things in my opinion are critical really for how we nestle into our strategies how we build our relationships and what we really do to create um, confidence in what we're doing as not just individuals but more importantly as a program because the leadership that we're bringing is more than just self it's about all those that we represent and everyone else that that's a part of us Right. Yeah, and I think you know, it's only those those three buckets that you mentioned are reflected in the in the master strategic plan of of your program, right? I mean that's 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 the organizational priorities. It's also your priorities. And if I could give encouragement to 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 our audience and everyone listening, it's a matter of how do we show that we're focused on those same three items. You know, when you start thinking about strategy maybe it's a talent strategy especially in the in, in, in this historic unprecedented labor shortage we're facing right now how does feeling safe at work actually have a positive impact on people wanting to come to work and staying with us sometimes we may not have the data but that's where we want the relationships with our colleagues whether it's in people in culture or recruiting or whomever to also include uh, to those that are really trying to say hey how are they selling the organization. It could be in a little bit more of a urban setting, a little higher crime than something that might be a little more remotely located. But frankly speaking, how are we helping those individuals sell? Culturally, the ability to feel safe, know they're going to be able to walk away safely and go home to their family safely right. is to me uh, is basic table stakes. And I think from a security perspective, understanding how that uh, the pulses are felt to me are, are really critical. And that just brings up a lot of issues about sort of managing the perceptions of safety. Right. Don, tell me what, what are some of your favorite things about managing the perception of safety? I mean, when you think about some of the, I'll call them the psychological deterrents, so you can call them whatever you want to fill in the blank with, but I, I, I know you've had uh, just a, a career full of little things that you did to really make people feel good about the environment they were working in. Yeah, again, that's a, that's another another broad question. You're, you're a challenging seminar lead today, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I think when you talk about perception, you know, one of the things that I always remember is that um, statistically, when when the, that the horrible 9-11 uh, occurrence happened in New York, that it, here in BC, miles and miles and miles, hundreds of thousands of miles away, the number of requests for escorts to vehicles by nurses uh, went through the roof. Uh, it increased that much, that, that person's personal perception of safety had shifted for something that had little or no likelihood of, of impacting them at that moment, right? So I think the perception of safety is really, really important for us to manage. So we need to we need to recognize people's perceptions and take it seriously. If people in Emerge tell us they don't feel safe, it's not enough to say, well, you know, our data shows your violence is down 8% uh, over last year. So in fact, you know, you're safer than you were a year ago. Um, we need to take the time and have the skills to get at those perceptions. What is it about the environment or, or, or an incident or, or sometimes it's, it's a story or a rumor that is causing you to feel that way and then address it? You know, I think we need to, we need to take that Take that head on and not be afraid of it, not poo poo it. And yeah, is that a little time consuming? Yeah. But, you know, the folks in your team have to have that kind of skill set to be able to listen, to empathize, to dig a little deeper, to explore and come back, come back with it with a response that that meets the requirement. You're not always going to be able to do it. But, you know, perception is reality for folks. If, if they don't feel safe, then you don't have a safe environment no matter what your data says. So you need to understand the perception and you, and you need to manage it. And sometimes it's, it's something as subtle as making a process change in, in a department or shifting a deployment of a security person or you know, doing a pilot for a short time and say, let's see if this impacts, right? So you know, one of the things we used to do is do perception surveys you know, before and after. So we're, it's, you, know, you take an immersed department and how safe do you feel? If, Create the questions, a bunch of categories, and based on that, 
make some changes and then assess them again six months later. Did it have the impact? Right. So I think I think the perception of safety, the perception of security is a really important piece for us. And and um, that's how I used to handle it anyway, Tony. And, and I'm sure you'll have something to add. Yeah, you know, Don, it's 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 amazing the psychological deterrence that we can put together. Um, I think it was Tim Fertali who I heard, first heard the term low cost, no cost type of approaches that, you know, he was uh, he was infamous for trying to to expose as many as he could, because if we could keep people feeling safe, I mean, when you really think about it, when we look at the events that happen, the security events that happen in healthcare, the likelihood of any one staff member or any one patient or visitor to be a, 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 a victim of one, of uh, the events is is really very very minor um so managing their perception has become a, a, a huge thing i mean from the education that we're providing to them whether they're new to our organization about the services that we deliver and and marketing what we are able to do as a security team to just getting into some of the things that we do with uh you know uh putting uh camera monitors in some of the waiting areas just to let them know that a security is taken with great importance right. here, but right. I also think it's a, a critical component just to make certain, hey, how well does the staff members look that are providing the security services? Because I think uh, a lot of folks get their perceptions based on observations they have of the individuals wearing the uniform themselves. Obviously not the only thing that they do, but I think it's uh, it, it, it's amazing. But I, I did want to just say, as we're as we're coming down to our time together, Don and I, I, I knew one thing would, for certain. Uh, our conversation today, would, the time would just fly. Um, so I, I did want to make certain people were realizing that we did want to leave some time at the end for some Q&A as we start closing up. But as I think about Don and, and the conversation, I really think a lot about, you know, we mentioned her a moment ago, people, process, technology. But if you've heard anything that I think you've said today, Don, that I think is really important, you've talked about the importance of having a multidisciplinary approach to your to your program, to right. those that you're engaged with, to those that you're using as your key stakeholders. And I guess I'll just close with any any words of wisdom as you start thinking about who do you think inside the organization that the security practitioner should be making it an effort to really establish positive relationships with. I know this list is going to be many, so you probably won't be all inclusive, but uh, but some of the folks that you just know that you think are just mission critical to, to really, really have a good relationship with. Well, you know, I always used to start looking at the healthcare budget and where does the predominant share of the budget go? It goes into care, direct care. So your your initial strongest relationships need to be on the on the clinical side, especially with your biggest customers who are generally, you know, behavioral mental health and, and the ED. So you need to have really strong relationships there, be really credible with them and and and, and invest a lot of time and energy in addressing their challenges because they're going to be your your biggest customer. You know, I think we've already talked about the executives, you know, who I, I also see as a, as a as a customer group. Um, the time that you invest with them, you know, uh, through uh, awareness, influence, those activities are are very well spent. Other key customers, I think, are traditional. You need a strong alignment with occupational health and safety, workplace health, whatever the, the program is called in your organization. Those particularly as it relates to workplace violence. Um, you need to work very, very, very closely with them. Um, similarly, I would say on the emergency management side, a lot of organizations have separate streams. Emergency management is, is very separate from security. Security plays a key role, especially in the response piece and in, in some of their key activities. Um, you need a very strong relationship with, with emergency management. And in fact, probably lead the development of some of the uh, emergency responses, whether it's bomb or or uh, even fire uh, and shared responsive facilities and and uh, the act of the assailant, of course, which I'm sure is going to be the subject of maybe a seminar on, on, its, on its own at some point. You know, you know and, and incidentally, as, a, as an aside, you know, this whole act of assailant uh, focus, which is, is increasing, obviously, as societal violence increases, you know, even going way back, we, we had a 2003, a very small hospital. I had a, a patient and her visitor, uh, shot and killed in their hospital room 
um, by a family member. Uh, we've had a, an escape at gunpoint from from an emergency department as well. Um, so the 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 phenomenon is not new. Is the risk increased, of course, um, but but we've been experiencing that those of us in the healthcare security industry for quite some time. So I think that's that's important as well. Also raises the question of your external connectivity. We talk about who are your key customers. How are you working with law enforcement? What's your relationship like with them? Um, especially around the delineation of responsibility if they're needed to come and support you, you know, in, in a situation involving violence or another emergency. I think the one we often overlook is around corrections. Some some organizations have uh, have a lot of correctional facilities in their jurisdictions and have a lot of hospital uh, visits by prisoners. You know, and IHSS has a great guideline on the prisoners as patients, but you know, it's a huge risk there. You know, if you talk about technology, not many people escape from from prisons anymore. So some of these folks that are doing lengthy sentences, this is their moment in time, their moment in their life when they're on a hospital escort that they could get away. You know, I think we really, we we really need to focus on our relationship with with the correctional agencies as well. So other internal customers, of course, Tony, the pharmacies, the facilities, you know, folk, folks who we regularly deal with or have specific security issues. But you know, we used to have a saying: nursing makes the world go round, and 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 that's where that's where, in my mind, your time and energy needs to be devoted in building relationships. Yeah, well said. Don and you know, back to the prisoner patients or prisoners as patients. Uh, uh, I think the uh, the data says that it's the second most common place for prisoner escapes attempts yeah. to occur, uh, right. only behind the uh, the court systems themselves when they're we're, when they're inside. Well, we do have a couple questions, Don. Um, uh, this is from Greg, uh, who's talking about creating slash changing culture. Wanted to say if there's any uh, any quick tips that we might want to provide uh, to the audience uh, as it relates to how best to, to to make a positive impact on culture. Yeah, you know, the first thing I would say is the question said quick tips. I would say eliminate the word quick uh, <laughs> because if, because there's no easy path. It, it, it's gonna it's gonna take time. You know, I think uh, I talked about exposure in the organization to the business of care, you know, sitting on committees that may not seem to have any direct relevance to security, but helps you learn about um, the business of care and helps those on the committee with you learn about your programs and maybe opens their eyes as to how you could how you could contribute. I think the people that you have working in your program day to day, um, it's really important that they reflect uh, that patient focused culture that 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 uh, empathy um that connectivity with the business of healthcare right again they're they're healthcare folks with security expertise you know the more that's conveyed the more that's shared in everyday interaction with people the stronger you're going to have that sort of culture that healthcare culture bred throughout your program and 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 then integrated into the organization it takes some time it really does. It takes some time. Sometimes it's tough to be patient, especially if you come from another organization that maybe has a very strong culture of of healthcare security. You kind of know where you need to get to, and you can get frustrated trying to get there. Um, but you need you need to focus the time. You need to hire the right people. You need to demonstrate success, and you need to demonstrate commitment to patients getting good care. I I, I would agree, and I think it, it that sort of has got an undercurrent of a lot of communication, right? right. Um, I, I have found that um, over the years, we know all the little things that are going on to keep these environments safe, but, um, and sometimes we think everybody else does, but they don't necessarily do. And it's important to paint a picture of what are all the things that we are doing to keep the environment safe? And how does that align with the bigger picture of why we're there? Um, why we're there is not just to be safety and security. Why we're there is to support an environment so quality patient care can be rendered and great patient outcomes are are, are, are occurring. And Absolutely. I think, it, you know, for those that have known me for a long time, they've probably heard the next thing. And that is, I would also say changing culture also looks at this. You want, you want all the folks that are working and wearing a uniform to look the part. And you want them to really 
pay attention to the little things. I mean, just in, in, in taking and wearing that uniform of pride because it shows that, hey, they care for themselves and, and they can take care of themselves. And that means they can take care for somebody else. Right. I also think they got to know their part. Um, so the investment in training and continuous development as team members uh, in healthcare, in security. And then lastly, uh, when it's time, they got to do their part. So it, it's, it's always important that we're doing it and we're learning um, continuously because even right. when we do things, we're going to have a moment to reflect back and say, I bet we could have done it better knowing if we had a moment to think. But our world typically happens um, in real time. And that means that uh, the officers and everyone in the security department is having to make some very important decisions. Yep. We got, one, we got one more question here, Don. Um, this is coming from Mike Dunning, who I think we've both known for, for years. But um, his, his comment is, with the healthcare industry changing, more outpatient facilities, as we've seen, Amazon's entrance into healthcare, how do you see this impacting uh, security planning? Um, I'm happy to take first stab at this if you'd like. Yeah. Um, one, I think we're going to see that the distribution of care is moving away from the hospital proper. And I think what that really requires of us as a whole is that well, what is in scope for us? Um, what used to be in scope was primarily uh, the campus that the hospital sat on and maybe the surrounding areas with an outpatient building or an MOB or professional office building, et cetera. Now we're seeing this distributed nature of care. And what does that mean? How are they being secured? Doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be with the security officer. It could mean that how are we using technology with remote video surveillance, using uh, the investment that we might have made in a security operations center, or we're using other communication tools to make certain folks are, are heavily relied upon um, to be able to get the assistance and be able to help them get support. But you said it earlier, Don, we also have to have relationships with our community response teams to know if we did have an event, what should be the expectation for who, who gets there and who serves their needs, especially if they have a very active situation that they just need help in, in the immediate. So, but those are a couple of things top of mind. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of these industries. Uh, a lot of folks are taking interest, vested interest in healthcare, putting a lot of money into healthcare. Right. Um, I think I saw recently that we're starting to see private equity here in the states making some pretty significant investments into rural healthcare, which, in many ways, uh, thankfully, uh, but that means they're going to be putting in uh, dollars. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, turns out, but. You know, Don, we, we've reached our time together, and let me just say thank you for taking time out of your day to spend time with me, to spend time with our audience. Um, you know, man, your insights are just simply amazing. I, I, I'm always in awe of our conversations. I feel like I learn something every single time, and new, normally I'm filling up my bag with a bunch of nuggets, and, and today <laughs> was no exception. Um, maybe I might yeah, might I feel I, 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 you never stop learning. I mean, that's one thing another attribute leaders share, right? You, you never stop learning that whole lifelong continuous learning piece. And for me, again, this was this was a conversation that you and I have had in various pieces uh, over time, and and I really enjoyed it. And I hope that I hope that the folks that that listened in and jumped in uh, uh, got a lot out of it because um, you know they're, they're, it, it's a great industry to work in. I have such respect for the folks that that are working in the healthcare security field. I know the last couple of years in particular uh, with COVID has been has been exhausting for healthcare security teams as well as healthcare security leaders. And, and you know, again, I just want to say to those of you on the line, thank you so much for, for what you do. And and uh, well, we know it's been a tough couple of years that hopefully hopefully we're beginning to move out of it now. Amen to that. And uh, without question, I think it's uh, a lot to be learned and a lot to continue to learn as this this industry is evolving. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, it was our inaugural session. I couldn't have asked for a better partner to, to be a, a, a part of this journey with me. Um, as Alex alluded to earlier, there will be a survey sent. Please feel free to share your insights and, and make certain that um, you share what topics you'd like us to explore a little further into the future. Next month, I'm really excited uh, to be joined by Robert Burns and Kat Kemper. We're gonna dive into the issue of how Roe versus Wade and the reversal 
and how it's going to have uh, potential impacts on the security risk of healthcare. Uh, I promise this won't be a political discussion as much as it's going to be how we learn from the history of violence that has stemmed from such a heated topic and issue and the impacts on what it means for all of us that really have to keep healthcare safe. So stay safe, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, everyone.